this session is it just networks the truth about iOS's multi peer connectivity framework. And Alban Duque is going to tell us about it. All right. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, thanks for coming in this early. Um, so, my name is Arben. I'm currently working at this company called Data Theorem, where I'm doing iOS uh, research because we are building a scanner for mobile apps, a security scanner. And before that, I was a consultant at Isaac Partners, and I worked on a bunch of tools uh, that you guys may have or not have used. Um, and so, Today, I'm here to talk about this new uh, Apple technology, which is called uh, multi peer connectivity, uh, which is pretty cool. And so, first of all, I'm just going to you know, describe what it actually is and like, the kinds of problems it's trying to solve. And then I'll uh, describe how I uh, reverse the protocol because it's all undocumented. So, uh, describe how it actually works behind the scenes when you're uh, using it. And lastly, once we know how it really works, I'll briefly talk about the actual security of the protocol and uh, the kind of assumptions you should make as a developer that's using that technology. Um, so multiple connectivity. So it was introduced in iOS uh, 7. Um, and so it's a new framework, so a new Apple library that you can use as a developer. And what it does, it, it lets you write an app that can find uh, the same app running on nearby devices. So you can find nearby devices and then start communicating with them um, and exchange data. So it was introduced in iOS 7. Uh, but what's kind of interesting is it was also introduced in the next version of macOS. So macOS Yosemite, which will be released in a month, uh, now also has that framework. And as you can see on the picture. So um, I'm just going to do a quick demo just so you guys get an idea of what it is. Um, all right. So, um, so on the left, there's a real iPad. On the right, it's the, the iOS simulator. Um, and so I just launched a simple multiple connectivity app, as you can see, and it's an app to exchange messages um, between nearby devices. And so the first thing you have to do when you're using that is make your app yourself visible to other devices that are around, um, as you can see on the right. And once you've done that, uh, Again, devices that are nearby can find you and you know, uh, connect with you. And so um, on the left, on the iPad, I'm just going to you know, browse for nearby devices, and it's going to find the simulator. Um, and so once you actually decide to connect to the device, you get a prompt, as you can see on the right, which uh, asks for confirmation whether you want to accept that connection or not. Uh, and so in that case, secret iPad. And if you accept, um, then the two devices are paired with each other, and now they can start exchanging data. And so, um, and so as you'll see, I can now uh, exchange messages between the two devices. Um, and so write text. It's, it's in the simple app, it's text, but it can be any data, and you can also exchange files. Um, and what's really cool about it is it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so no need for internet connectivity, no need for a cell signal. It's just, you know, finding nearby devices using peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So uh, it's pretty cool. There's one app that's kind of famous now that's using it. It's called FireChat. Uh, and it, it's kind of like this one. It lets you chat with people around you. Uh, for example, when you're, when you're in the subway or you know, wherever. So it finds uh, people that are around you, and you can chat with them. So um, that's it for the demo. So, so it's pretty cool because it's very easy to use as an app developer. You, in like 10 lines of code, you can have something like that. Uh, so it's pretty slick, but so the reason why I, w I wanted to, uh, you know, do some research on it is that it's completely undocumented. So um, there's documentation on how to use it, but when you actually want to know how it really works, there's nothing. So uh, for example, the first screenshot is when you start googling for internal strings and constant, and you get no results. Um, and then the other thing is there are security, there are security settings you can use. Uh, so you can specify which encryption you want. And there's also authentication. Uh, but since you don't know how it really works, it's hard to tell how these security settings work. So uh, overall, because it's all undocumented, it was interesting. Uh, and so I ended up you know, having a look at the protocol and try to figure out how it works. 
uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, but before I get into the details, there's two things I need to mention so you guys uh, can get a better understanding. So when you're using the multiplayer connectivity framework as a developer, there's two security settings you can specify. There's the encryption preference, um, and there's three levels, optional, required, or none, uh, and that's a screenshot from the documentation. Um, so you have to specify which encryption you want, and that's all you get in the documentation. There are, there are no other details, the kind of algorithm that are used, or you know, how it works. That's really all you have. So that's the first uh, security setting, and the other one is authentication. So you can enable authentication. To do that, you have to, uh, in your app, you have to specify an identity, which is an X509 certificate uh, and a private key. And so that's going to be your, your app's identity when it's pairing with other devices. Um, and the other thing you have to do is also write a callback that's going to be called when you have to validate the other person's certificates as they try to connect to you. Um, and so that's authentication. So two security settings, encryption and authentication. Um, and the, the, the default settings are optional encryption and no authentication. And so back to uh, reversing the protocol. So the test setup I had was exactly what you saw in the demo, so a real iPad. Um, and then the iOS simulator with that sample app that I did have to modify, but uh, same similar setup. Uh, I only looked at the Wi-Fi. So something I didn't mention, it, it uses Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Uh, and you don't really get to choose as a developer. It just tries to find the best thing. Uh, so I disabled Bluetooth because I didn't want to have to sniff Bluetooth. So uh, my study was only on Wi-Fi. Um, and so, well, so when you want to start reversing a protocol, the first thing you're going to do uh, is uh, you know, look at the packet capture. And so when you do that with multi-peer connectivity, um, what you're going to see is that there are four different protocols, uh, and two of them seem to be well known, and Wireshark is able to uh, identify them and figure out what they are. And there's, there's, there's like two mystery protocols where Wireshark doesn't know what it is. Um, and so what I'm going to do is briefly talk about the two protocols that are well known. Uh, but if you want more details, you can just look it up online, and there's tons of documentation. And then I'll spend more time on the two uh, proprietary protocols, because that's uh, the more interesting part. And so the first protocol you'll see is called Bonjour. It's an Apple technology. It's, it's used to find um, services on a LAN. So for example, uh, it's how your Mac finds a printer and things like that that are on the LAN. And so that's what multiple connectivity is using to find uh, phones around. Um, and so your app basically advertises a bonjour service, and you just have to choose a name for that service. So for example, for Fire, the FireChat app, the name they chose is FireChat. Uh, and so now, uh, so now the FireChat app is going to advertise its multiple connectivity service, and then nearby devices can find it. Um, and so once they find that service, they get um, the IP address and the, uh, the TCP port to connect to that service. And that's why the next protocol which is unknown, uh, is over TCP, and it uses the information that uh, the app got from Bonjour to actually connect. Um, and so when you look at it, um, it's definitely plain text. Um, and so the few things you have to you quickly uh, n notice is, uh, so at the beginning, you can see the names of the devices, uh, secret iPad, iPhone simulator. And then uh, something you can see is BPLIS00, which is the magic a uh, header for a binary plist, which is an Apple file format uh, to store key values. So there's like the XML. You can write it as XML or as a binary plist, and that's what's right there. Um, so looking at the protocol, so the first two things, each peer exchange what's called their peer ID, which is their name, iPhone simulator, plus some kind of random uh, string. So you know, one, two, three, G, something, something. Uh, that's a peer ID. And then they exchange three plists. Um, so again, plists are a key value pairs. Uh, the first plist is, so it's sent by the, the peer who's initiating the connection uh, and has a bunch of keys. The ones that are interesting are the peer ID key. So it sends oops, its own peer ID key, which is that iPhone simulator string I just talked about. So the sender peer ID key. And then it also sends the recipient's peer ID key. So they can sort of make sure they are talking to each other and not someone else. Um, and once that's done, that's when you get the prompt that you saw in the demo. 
uh, with the name of the other guy uh, who wants to connect. Uh, and if the user says yes, then B sends back another plist. One thing that's in it is whether they accepted the invite or not. Uh, so yes or no. And lastly, there's a, a third plist that's exchanged. And, and the main, the key thing here is that they're exchanging something called um, the connection data key. So each peer is sending to the other guy their own uh, connection data key. And that's actually the main uh, payload of that protocol. That's the, the whole reason why that protocol is happening is to actually get there and exchange that connection data key. Uh, and so, so that payload is briefly mentioned in the, in the documentation. It's called connection data. But uh, of course, they don't tell you what's in it. So uh, if you actually have a look, um, it's pretty interesting. So the first thing is, uh, in byte one, you have the peer security settings. So uh, whether authentication is enabled and the level of encryption. So they're all packed in a, in a byte, so it's a bit film. Uh, and so that's what that, that byte is. So five means uh, authentication enabled and no encryption, for example. Um, so it's just the security settings. There's no certificates yet or anything like that. Uh, so that's one thing. And then there's a list of candidate IP addresses. And I'll define candidates uh, after that. So a list of IP addresses, so 192, 168, 18, um, et cetera. So a list of IP addresses. Uh, which are the, the peer's local IP addresses on all network interfaces. Um, and then some kind of IDs, and I actually have no idea what they are, but if you look at the debug logs, they're called IDs. Um, so to be, uh, to be investigated, and then also port numbers. So basically, that connection data key is the peer's list of local IP addresses and UDP port, and it's being sent to the other guy. Um, and the reason why it's doing this, so it's exchanging candidate UDP sockets. Um, and so the next protocol, which is called ICE, uh, for interactive connectivity establishment. So that's a well-known protocol. And what it does is from a list of candidate IP addresses and port numbers, it's going to do connectivity checks to try to find the best network path to the other guy. Um, and so that's why in the previous protocol, each, each peer exchanged their list of IP addresses, and now ICE is going to use that to find the best network pass. And in the debug logs, that's what you see. So it lists, it lists all these addresses and port number, and then it's going to send packet to see which one works best. Um, and if you want more details, again, it's well documented, so you can look it up. But once that's done, um, then each peer knows uh, an IP address and a port number to connect to the other guy over UDP. And that's where the last uh, protocol comes in. So it's something over UDP. Um, and so when you look at it, Wireshark has no idea what it is. Uh, and it does not seem to be plain text, uh, as you can see. Uh, and that's also that's a protocol that's used when you actually send messages. So as I was doing in a demo, uh, you know, sending text messages, that's where they are. But obviously, it's not plain text. So it's kind of uh, intriguing. Um, but you can sort of, when you're looking at the, the framework, you can sort of guess what it is because one thing I briefly mentioned is when you use authentication, it's going to use SSL certificates, X509 certificates. So that's kind of a clue on what it should be. Uh, and then if you actually set a breakpoint on a, an SSL function, so SSL handshake, which is Apple's SSL handshake function, uh, the breakpoint gets triggered right in that protocol. And uh, if you look at the stack trace, you can see that function, GCK session perform DTLS handshake. So that pretty much gives it away. So that's DTLS, but it's very strange because Wireshark knows how to parse DTLS. Uh, but in that case, it's not working for some reason. Um, so kind of strange. So what I ended up doing was looking at normal DTLS protocol and see if there were any differences. So at the top is that protocol, and then at the bottom it's when you use the OpenSSL command line tool. Um, and so if you stare at the screen long enough, maybe you'll uh, see it. But um, so basically, the first thing you see is 16 FEFF, which is 16 is the beginning of a DTLS record, and FEFF is the version of TLS. So FEFF means DTLS 1.0. Um, so that's there in the, in the mystery protocol. But then there's a difference, uh, as you can see, which is there's a byte at the very beginning, D0, which isn't there in like normal DTLS traffic. Uh, and so if you spend more time looking at that, and also, so, so that seems to be 
the only difference. And if you actually go ahead and remove that byte, uh, it turns out you can edit packet trace with a text editor, which was new to me. Um, so if you remove that D0 byte uh, using search and replace, uh, then Wireshark is able to pass uh, the, the packet trace and figure out that it's DTLS. So basically, the mystery protocol is DTLS 1.0 with D0 appended to every DTLS record. Um, and it doesn't matter the, which device you're using, which version of iOS or anything, it's always going to be D0, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, and I don't know why, it, why it's there, but um, it does break every uh, TLS tool ever created. So um, kind of annoying. And, so, and then if you actually look inside the detail stream, uh, it's just a really simple plain text protocol where when you send a, a message, like I was doing in a demo, you just see that message and the other guy's PID, and that's it. So it's very simple. Um, and that's it. So that's the whole uh, stack. Um, and when you are reading the documentation, they mention two things, the discovery phase and the session phase. And the discovery phase is these first three protocols, and the session phase where you actually exchange data is the last one. Um, and that's it. So now I'm going to talk about um, how the security settings I mentioned, how they affect the whole flow. Um, and so as I said, there's three levels of encryption, non-optional required, and uh, authentication, which can be enabled or disabled. Uh, and so when, when you change these settings, the only thing that gets affected is actually the last protocol, uh, GCK2. Um, and so if you look at the first combo, I guess, um, so encryption required with authentication, what you get is so DTLS, and it's using mutual authentication. So each um, each peer exchange a certificate, and then um, so what's kind of interesting is it has 30 different cipher suit enabled, um, including uh, cipher suit that give you perfect forward secrecy. But the problem is that perfect forward secrecy is actually never used because in practice, uh, when the peers actually choose the cipher suit, they're always going to choose the same one, which is RSA with AES which doesn't have perfect world secrecy. So PFS is enabled, but not actually used. Um, and overall, they don't really need 30 different cipher suits because the client and the server is always going to be multiple connectivity. So it's not like you need IE6 to be able to connect to that. So they could probably reduce that to maybe two uh, cipher suits. But um, I mean, overall, it's, it looks pretty good. Uh, you have authentication, and you actually do get that with DTLS. So um, no surprises there. Um, if you look at uh, encryption required without authentication, you get DTLS, but this time it's using the anonymous cipher suit. So no certificates are exchanged. That's how these cipher suits work. So of course you're vulnerable to many manual attacks. Uh, still no surprises there because when you set these settings, you did specify that you didn't want authentication. So you're vulnerable to many manual attacks. So it's kind of expected, but it's good to know how it actually works. Um, and then encryption none. So without authentication, it's just that plain text protocol I just briefly mentioned. So no DTLS. Um, so it's plain text. Again, no surprises because you said you didn't want encryption. So you don't get encryption. Um, then with authentication, um, that's gonna be, this one is kind of interesting. So you get DTLS with mutual authentication. Um, but it's using the null cipher suits, which are cipher suits that don't encrypt anything. Um, so as you can see, RSA with null SHA. So basically, you have authentication, but all the traffic is plain text. Um, again, that's kind of what you asked for, so no surprises there. Uh, but now, um, the more interesting one, so encryption optional. Um, so the documentation says this session prefers to use encryption, but will accept an encrypted connection, um, which is kind of interesting. So the first case, we, um, so without, sorry, without authentication, it basically doesn't matter because you don't have authentication, so you're going to be vulnerable to many nominal attacks anyway. Um, but the more interesting case is when you have authentication and encryption optional. So as I said, the documentation says prefers to use encryption. So the assumption there is that if you have authentication and the, the two peers have encryption optional, they're going to actually switch to encryption required. 
uh, and that's what this sentence imply, because they prefer to use encryption. Um, but so in reality, um, so if you go back to how it all works, um, and so and this diagram tries to show you what's wrong. Um, so you have bonjour, and then they exchange our security settings. And this is all before authentication, it's all plain text. Then uh, ICE, and then finally the DTLS uh, handshake. Um, so there's something that's kind of wrong with that. Um, because the security settings are exchanged before authentication, so someone is doing a man in the mode attack. Um, what they can do is change uh, these security settings as they're being exchanged. Uh, and so they can basically downgrade encryption optional to encryption none um, and do that for the two peers. And so now each peer thinks that the other guy doesn't support encryption. Um, and so when you do that, then you get DTLS with uh, no encryption. Um, so basically, the traffic is still authenticated, but it's plain text, so you can see all the data. Uh, you didn't need to have a certificate to, do, to impersonate anyone. You didn't need anything. Um, and now you can see all the traffic. Um, and the, the problem here is that what they should be doing is, after authentication, they should check that the security settings that were exchanged at the beginning are what they thought it was. So they should make sure, oh, you sent me encryption optional. That's what I received. And they can confirm that what they sent what, what, was what the other guy received. Uh, because if that's not the case, then someone changed the settings on the way. Uh, but they're not doing it, so, so you have a downgrade attack. Um, and so when you do that, then that's what you see uh, on the network. So it's DTLS, as you can see with the D017FEFF, but then it's plain text, so that's the test message. So that's unexpected. Uh, that's not what the documentation says, uh, and you probably shouldn't use it um, because you're vulnerable to downgrade attacks. And so Overall, um, most, most of the security settings, they work as the documentation say, says, um, except for the one I just described. Um, and even without this one, there are combinations that, as an app developer, you shouldn't use. Um, encryption optional, there's no good use case for that. Uh, because data is, you know, it's sensitive or not sensitive, but it's not optionally sensitive. So uh, I wouldn't use encryption optional. And then encryption none with authentication means you're uh, getting the, you know, the performance hit of DTLS because you have to do all the handshake. But then no encryption, so it's kind of, you know, kind of a waste. Uh, and lastly, only, as expected, only encryption required with authentication is actually secure. So if you go back to that small table, uh, you shouldn't use all the dark cells because there's no good use case. And then um, the red and the, the orange one are vulnerable, but if the data is not sensitive, then it might be okay uh, to use that. Um, so things Apple could do to improve the framework. Uh, one is uh, prioritizing perfect world secrecy for when you use encryption, because they are already enabled but not being actually used, which is uh, too bad. Um, so prioritizing that. And then for encryption optional with authentication, which is that downgrade attack I, I described, so there's two options. One is they should, um, either they should validate the security settings as they were exchanged, validate them after authentication to make sure, again, what they received was what the other guy sent. Um, and if you think about it, so SSL2 has a similar issue where in SSL2, someone in the middle could uh, force each side to pick a specific cipher suit that was weak. Um, and in SSL3, in SSL3, they fixed that by doing exactly that. So by, after the authentication happened in SSL3, each side uh, exchanged a hash of all the previous handshake messages to make sure they saw the same thing and that no one was trying to mess with the traffic. Um, and, I mean, and better, I think, so a better option, I think, is to just remove encryption optional because I, I don't think there's a good uh, use case for that. Um, so th there are many things that I didn't have time to talk about. So I'll put more stuff on my blog and a also a tool. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thanks, everyone. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the question is, uh, what's the default setting? So the default setting is optional with no authentication. Which is, so yeah, they should remove optional. No authentication as default is kind of expected because you have to deploy certificates in your app. So uh, Apple could take care of that, honestly, but uh, so. Uh, so the question is, is it used by the handoff feature that's in iOS 8 where you can start writing an email on your phone and then switch to your Mac? Yeah. Uh, I actually don't know. So one thing I looked at on iOS 8 was HomeKit, which is uh, that framework to send messages to home devices. And in that case, it was not using this. Uh, for handoff, I have no idea. I haven't checked yet. So the, the question is, so the question is, when Apple uses that, what are the security things they're using? So I don't know anything, any uh, Apple thing that's using this because AirDrop is not using this, uh, as opposed to what people claim. That's that AirDrop is different. Um, so I have no example of an Apple app that's using this. Um, Uh, so I looked at it. I think they are using the default settings. Uh, so the question was, what, what, which settings is FireChat using? But FireChat is not really, they don't have to care about security because it's an anonymous chat app. So there's no need for like strong authentication because you don't even know who you're talking to. So um, they're, they're, they're fine. Yes. No, so the question is what, what happens whoops, when you have um, encryption but no authentication? Sorry, authentication but no encryption, that's what you get. So it's DTLS, uh, but it's using that no encryption cipher suit, which no one uses uh, for good reasons. And so, so that's what you get uh, on the network. So there's a DTLS recall, and inside it's plain text. So it's, uh, it's HMAC, you can't you know, modify the packets or do anything like that. Um, so I can't really hear you, actually. Okay. This one? Sure. So uh, let me go back a bit. So when you look at the documentation, there's two phases, discovery, which is how you find uh, nearby devices, and then session, which is how you exchange data. Um, and so the first three protocols here are part of the discovery phase. It's all about finding the same app running on different phones around you and then exchanging some settings to then finally uh, establish an UDP, a UDP stream with that device, which is uh, the thing at the end. Um. Yes. Developer settings. So the question is, these are all user settings. So there are settings you set when you write your app as a developer. So as a developer, you have to decide what you want to use. Um, the user has no control on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, is it using Bluetooth by default? Um, I don't know. It's, so it's going to either use Bluetooth or normal Wi-Fi or peer-to-peer Wi-Fi, which is an Apple peer-to-peer -peer thing. Uh, how it decides which one to use, I have no idea. I think it just tries to find the easiest thing. So I think it would go for Bluetooth first, I'm guessing. But I haven't really looked at Bluetooth. So, um, and, and, and you know, they don't give you the choice as a developer. You cannot say, oh, I want to use Bluetooth. So, so it's all transparent. No, 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 you can't. So you just say, I want to connect to nearby devices, and you don't know if it's going to be Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Or... Uh, all, right. all right, thanks, everyone.